Hello and welcome to Food Farming in Philadelphia, the impact of organic agriculture on human and environmental health in the city of brotherly love. I'm Julie Hancher. I am co-founder and editor of Green Philly. We are a media company that connects people to sustainable solutions, which is why I'm so excited to be talking about three things I love, food, who doesn't love food, farming, I actually do some urban gardening with the container myself. I grew up with my dad um, basically planting a ton of food in our backyard. I remember I really didn't understand like why um, we were eating tomatoes from our garden, but obviously I appreciate that so much more now. My dad still gives me starter plants and helps me grow every time I'm gardening through a new season. And the Riddle Institute has been a huge impact on me and my family throughout my life. Um, but also, you know, we're also here to make sustainability on behalf of Green Philly, um, easy, accessible, low cost, which is another reason why farming and this topic is so relevant. Um, so Green Philly, we put out articles five days a week. We also host events just like this, um, as well as an annual sustainability award ceremony in the city of brotherly love, celebrating, um, the local region and what's happening on a local level on sustainability called Sustain PHL every August little impacted last year due to the pandemic, but hopefully we'll be back in person again. Um, and I'm so excited to be talking and be host, be moderating this panel about food farming in Philadelphia, besides my personal connections, uh, because of this topic. Food isn't just about what we eat, but it also impacts so much around us. It impacts our health, what we're eating, um, the impact of the land around us as well. It can also impact our surrounding environment, whether our food is coming from miles away or whether it is being grown in our backyards or in the city of brotherly love or wherever we are living. If you're not from Philadelphia proper today, you also have a lot of relevant info as well. Another big impact of farming and what will become more relevant is also thinking about climate change. So climate change will make Philadelphia hotter and wetter so for example, in I think by 2050 or 2100 maybe, uh, the city of Philadelphia is expected to be more like the temperatures of war as Mexico if we do not do stuff about climate change. So that can cause a lot of problems. We've all witnessed the past couple of weeks how Texas uh, completely shut down, um, just the disruptions that happened there. There could also be uh, a lot of disruptions in our supply chains and our food supply chain um, as climate change becomes a very big um, issue over the upcoming years. So the more we can localize our food system, prioritize you know, healthy food for our people and for our families and friends and our communities, the more we can think and uh, try to make organic food accessible and uh, ac accessible and just local to people in our communities uh, and also focusing on the people whether you are employing the people that can grow the food, whether you're nourishing your communities and people or whether you are just bringing people together. How many people think of food, um, you know, and going to tables or celebrating events because of that. These are just some of the topics that we'll be touching on today or you'll be hearing how this all connects. Um, but that's why I'm so excited. I mean, I love eating, I love CSAs and supporting our local farmers. And I'm excited to hear how each of these panelists will also be you know, bringing um, food and helping create that access and uh, benefits to the communities as well. So just a couple of quick logistical things. Uh, we do, will have a discussion with our panelists for about an hour, and then we will have a Q&A portion where you can submit your questions to the panelists. So please put those into the chat. There's a Q&A Q &A box on the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, you can put it in the Q&A box and then towards the end, we, um, I'll be moderating the Q&A as well. Um, and also we will have one survey question at the end. So please make sure to give us your feedback and answer that question. So uh, before we get into the panel, I also would love to introduce one of our first panelists and also on behalf of the Rudale Institute. Uh, Emily Newman is Rudale Institute's Organic Crop Consulting Program Manager. She joined the consulting team in January 2020 and helps farmers navigate organic compliance as a tradition, tra transition to certified organic. 
So Emily, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Julie. And uh, thanks to everybody who's attending on this, uh, if you're in Pennsylvania, rainy Saturday morning. Um, first, before I talk a little bit about Rodale, I'd like to take some time to thank the panelists. I generally work with rural farmers um, in rural areas, uh, but I recently had the opportunity actually just this past Wednesday to visit Krista's farm, uh, a farmer on the panel. And I'm realizing now like how urban agriculture has been left out of the conversation a lot when it comes to food production, uh, but it's important to recognize the impact that these small localized spaces can have on our food system. Um, in the time of COVID, you know, a lot of the conversation has been around how broken our food system is and urban agriculture really has the opportunity to disrupt that. Uh, and this local, lo localized system is really equitable. Um, and I think it's the future of agriculture. So I want to thank the panelists who are here um, who've made that happen in Philadelphia. So as Julie said, my name's Emily Newman. I am the program manager with Rodale Institute's uh, Organic Craft Consulting Program. Um, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture supports organic farmers through their Pennsylvania Farm Bill, which has actually allowed our team to provide free consulting to farmers who are interested in organic production um, all across Pennsylvania. So because of this bill, we're able to really make an impact on the ground one-on-one -on -one with farmers to help them address technical um, problems that they're uh, facing on their farms with pest weeds and diseases, but also understanding, understanding and managing the compliance on their operation. So Rodale Institute is a 333 acre research and education farm in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. It's about an hour and a half north of Philly. Um, our, our goals are really to reduce the barriers uh, to farmers transitioning to organic through research and education. And we also focus a lot on consumer education. Our research projects um, are include a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, grain crop production called the Farming Systems Trial. Um, we're comparing different aspects of crop production such as yield, nutrient density, energy usage, and financial returns, comparing an organic system um, next to a conventional system. And we also have a vegetable systems trial that, that does the same thing. One study that uh, should be of particular interest to today's attendees is the Watershed Impact Trial. And we're gonna be talking a lot about water and farming today. So um, this has been done uh, with the support of the William Penn Foundation and in partnership with Stroud Water Research that's located in Chester County. Um, the goal of the project is really to understand how different agricultural practices have an impact on water um, and our supply chain. So the trial is going to be running for six full years. Uh, we are in year three and a half of that. So we're about halfway through that trial. Um, and it's looking at different management practices uh, so organic um, in a conventional tillage operation, organic no-till, uh, conventional with some tillage, and then conventional no-till. And we're collecting data on the quality and composition of the water runoff, the ability for the soil to infiltrate water, the presence of harmful compounds, uh, residues of pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides in the water. So um, you can find out more information about that specific trial, but we are we have um, a research plot as at our Rodale Institute farm in Kutztown, and then we also have a research plot um, at Stroud Water Research in Chester County. So I'll be talking a lot more today about water quality and how that relates to uh, farming, but that just frames the conversation uh, for today. Thanks, Julie. Great, thanks, Emily. Yeah, and also on a big initiative that we also have at Green Philly is talking about our local watershed too. So I'm really excited to bring in some of those, uh, you know, relevant conversations to food farming and things that you may not even think about from our water supply. And I was saying even last night um, to one of the organizers from Rodale, which, which was great, how I have a friend and uh, we were kayaking, I think, not, you know, maybe two falls ago or whatever. And she didn't realize the Delaware River and the Poconos was the same Delaware River next to Philadelphia that supplies our water. And it's such a simple concept, right? But it's just thinking about how we're all connected in all these different ways and everything else. 
So and Julie, I forgot to mention about the Grow Clean Water Project as well. I got too excited talking about research, which is <laughs> tends to happen on my panel. So um, I want to I want to make sure that I touch on the Grow Clean Water Initiative as well, which was launched in 2019, and it's aiming to educate young families in the Philly area about that connection between farming practices and healthy rivers and streams and how that relates. And um, yeah, really thanks to the William Penn Foundation for making this large scale research and this consumer education happen. Great. Thanks, Emily. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the water and farming in a brief moment. So I will introduce the other excellent panelists we have for today. I'm so excited to talk to all of them and hear their great uh, perspectives on this topic. So first, we have Krista Barfield, who is Farmer John Philly, a uh, Farmer John Philly who is a healthcare professional turned farmer, a 33 year old mother of two and a lifelong Germantown resident. After an adventure in January, 2018, she returned home inspired to connect the land, plant life and social issues that heavily impact black and brown communities. Since 2018, she has developed earth born brands, including Viva, Life, Viva Leaf Tea Company and Farmer John Community Supported Agriculture and also as a sustained PHL 2020 recipient. Um, Justin Treza joined Pennsylvania Horticultural Society as its director of community gardens program in 2017, after having worked with several agroecological and grassroots organizations. Justin works closely with his team, which includes the City Harvest Initiative to support community and cooperative gardens throughout Philadelphia for a successful growing season. And last but certainly not least, we have Carly Porzand, who is the People's Kitchen Organizing Director at 215 two People's Alliance, a multiracial collaborative fighting for equity and justice in Philadelphia. Since the onset of COVID-19, she has worked alongside other community members, chefs, organizers, and restaurant workers to shape the People's Kitchen into a people-powered project that is reimagining the food system. So as you can see, we have four amazing panelists. I'm so excited to talk to all of them and help facilitate this conversation today. So I did wanna start off uh, asking Krista, so I know we're talking about organic farming practices are not just about the absence of chemicals and rather about what you were creating. Um, so can you please share the story of your farm? I know I just hinted about your adventure and what inspired you to start this mission? Yeah, you know, um, I like you said, I did work in healthcare for 10 years, and I, upon traveling to Martinique on this vacation that I took, um, I took by myself as a solo trip, and um, I had the opportunity to meet, um, by happenstance, some farmers, as well as people that were just connected to the land. I think in Caribbean countries, they just tend, that's just the way that they do things, um, but I had a cup of tea that was literally um, brewed for me from leaves that were picked from a garden in the, this uh, host backyard. And so it was really peculiar to me, something I had never seen people taking herbs from, you know, right out the ground and putting them in a cup and, you know, brewing you a tea, uh, in essentially a cup of health, literally. Um, and so that inspired me um, on a, from a growing standpoint and wanting to know more about how we did things here in, in America and, um, the connection to tea and health and, and plants and health. And uh, after that, I actually went to another Airbnb on the same island and was introduced to a family of farmers who invited me down to their farm and invited me to pick and pack boxes for their CSA members. And I also got an opportunity to see their CSA members come pick up their items. So I was really inspired after this vacation and I decided to, to come home and um, really brainstorm how I could re- incarnate my healthcare career that I had just walked away from and combine it with these experiences. And that's what I've done. That's great. I love the, I love the connection. Um, and just like Krista was talking, you know, about the healthcare background and obviously the connection with our bodies, um, you know, how we like to feed our bodies with good food. Also something that people may not initially think about is how important it is to feed soil. Um, I read this book, I think 10 years ago about the food system. They spent a whole chapter on soil and dirt. And I'm like, why am I reading about dirt? Like, why does it matter? But after reading that one chapter, I started composting and signed up for a service in my uh, city apartment and been doing that for the past 10 years or so. 
Um, so I'm curious from Emily now, why is soil health so important? You know, what's the connection and why do farmers, like, what is, well, you know, how can they create healthy soil? What is that? Yeah, I think it's really important to kind of touch on the conventional farming system first and, and talk about how soil health hasn't always been the focus. And I know that, it, you know, we hear soil health constantly in conversations now and there's Netflix documentaries about it. Like soil health is mainstream these days. And that's something that's very funny that, um, you know, that we can talk about soil and it, it, and it in everyday conversation. But, um, you know, one thing to mention the difference between some conventional farmer farming practices and organic farming practices that, you know, when a organic farmer is feeding the earth, when they are building nutrients in their soil, they're using natural inputs like compost and manure and all these really good um, nutrient dense products. But, you know, in conventional farming systems, they're focusing on synthetic inputs and synthetic fertilizers. And and how, you know, how we're building that soil health is really important. And so using those manures and using those composts are really, really important in the farming system. But there's also, you know, several other practices that we see organic farmers using, such as cover cropping. And what that is, is they're actually using the plants to feed the next crop. So um, in certain scenarios, they can use clovers or um, alfalfa, which are legumes, and they fix nitrogen. So in instead of having to put these, you know, synthetic nitrogen products onto the ground, they're actually feeding the next crop with more plants, which is really amazing, you know, process and cycle. And so, um, you know, there's really important aspects to, to soil health. And, and one thing I want to point out is, is how that relates to water. And so, as we are building soil health, we're building soil organic um, matter into that. And more soil organic matter means more water we can hold in the soil profile. And so nitrogen and phosphorus are two really important products that are needed for plants. Every farmer needs to be using those products in their, uh, for their plants. But if we use them in excess, there's opportunity for them to percolate through that soil profile, run into waterways, and, and nitri nitrogen can cause nitrate pollution, which is actually the cause of blue baby syndrome and can be really harmful to human health. And phosphorus can cause algae blooms and, you know, it's not, it's, actually causes dead zones in, in water bodies. And so when we're building soil health, when we're adding soil organic matter to our soil profile, we're holding the nutrients where they should be so that they're not percolating through the water and going into the groundwater and harming the water quality. Great. And I also see in the chat, people are recommending Kiss the Ground. And I know other people are getting so excited about this movie. So another, if you want some more info on that, a good resource on Netflix. Um, but, you know, speaking of the soil health and everything that may seem far away, uh, Justin, you know, I know PHS uses horticulture to promote the well-being of people for positive social and environmental change. So I'm curious, you know, how you translate some of these concepts that may seem foreign and, you know, how do you and your work at PHL, PHS, I mean, uh, help increase awareness of how our food um, is grown on Philadelphia? What, do, you know, what is your work um, with this and how you bring it to the local communities? Sure, thanks, Julie. Um, you know, I, th I think the important thing that we're doing at PHS, and not just PHS, there's a number of organizations doing it here in Philadelphia, is really advocating for community gardens, urban agriculture. Um, it's not really a new thing. It's been going on for centuries. It's just become more of a popular term these days. And I think people are recognizing more and more, you know, where their food is coming from and the importance of a localized, you know, food system. So at PHS, a lot of our work is really around supporting growers. Um, Emily brought up cover crops. You know, that's something we support growers with. We provide cover crops, row cover, everything for them to have a productive growing season. Um, and what we're really trying to do is redistribute or increase access to fresh produce. Um, you know, unfortunately, Philadelphia has one of the highest rates of hunger in the nation. Um, you know, COVID is only going to exacerbate that more where they're looking at 20% of the population of Philadelphia now will be, you know, have some level of food insecurity. So, you know, it's something very important to address. And I think getting more individuals growing food and then with the excess produce donating that back or, you know, putting that back into the food system, distributing it to neighbors is extremely important. Great. 
And, you know, also just like the way we grow food on a farm, everything else happens in a mutual, uh, mutually beneficial relationships. So Carly, I know your, um, your project at the People's Kitchen is a model of that. Um, how is your project not only about the food that we're talking about, but also benefiting the entire community of where it's grown? Yeah, I'm sitting here smiling because we're talking about soil health and I got a text from one of our peep growers in our neighborhood that we have this garden and they're like, my friend just got me seed starting soil and a seed tray and I'm going to start making seeds in my basement. And I'm like, yes. So I think that maybe some of these conversations around soil and things like that we're not necessarily having right now. Um, but what we are having is people in the neighborhood that we're, you know, growing and building this garden in, invested in the process. Um, so the People's Kitchen is creating, um, reimagining the food system a little bit by localizing the food system. So we give out 215 completely free chef cooked meals a day. Um, but over the summer, you know, we were, there's a lot of our members and folks who are in our Point Breeze, which is where this garden is in my background. Um, and we sort of had this really exciting pilot that happened because a part of the garden was overgrown. And a lot of us were friends or neighbors or had had conversations with the church that owns this land. We don't take or claim that we are owning or this is our land. Um, and they, they wanted someone to help manage the garden and like support the maintenance and we wanted a place to grow ingredients to go into our free meals so it kind of created this beautiful symbiotic partnership um, because now we're growing the ingredients in this garden um, pu putting them in our meals that chefs are cooking in our kitchen and then bringing those meals right back to the church that hands it out to their neighbors um, we really feel like this process, this conversation around food, the food system, food justice can't happen without racial and economic justice. So that's at the center of our work, um, the center of our conversations. And I think it all starts with relationship building and like one-on-one -on -one friendship and having a conversation with each other and having people who in their own neighborhoods decide things about their neighborhood and you know, doing what we can to support their process. Um, so I feel like the people's kitchens like evolving literally every day because every day we're meeting new people or having new conversations that shift what we're doing or shift how we're talking about what we're doing or, you know, help us think about a policy that needs to be in place that supports what they need. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a little bit about uh, how we're trying to function and maybe not perfect, but I think we're like getting it happening every day and learning every day. Great, and I know Sylvia, you're talking about the community and the community surrounding the food and um, Krista having the community shared agriculture, which is in the actual name of the word. Um, but you know, healthy food access and even organic shouldn't necessarily or should not be a privilege. Um, what needs to change in Philadelphia? And I'd like to ask you, Krista, specifically to provide more access for marginalized communities um, and what role do you think we could all play in that as well? Um, the major thing for me, I feel like uh, farming needs to become a mainstream term in urban communities and even having the community gardens doesn't do enough for that for the low income um, black and brown communities. S still farming it is a very foreign term and even though it has become a lot more popularized um, because of social media hugely and because of the pandemic those going hand in hand people, the conversation of people knowing where their food comes from has become a lot more important. Um, but it's like, what are the action steps for people that look like me and live in neighborhoods like I do? What are the action steps for us to really get involved? And so that's one of the main reasons why um, I also wanted to make sure that everything I do is as close to the urban community as possible. Um, and it's not so rural or even um, I think there's like steps between there's like rural, then there's urban, and then there's like hyper urban where you're like literally in the city. And so we places that are organizations that are using empty lots around the city 
um, to provide agricultural jobs for the community, I think is a huge step that we should be taking, um, where we're actually teaching the people that are living in the neighborhoods how to grow the food, but also paying them to do so, so that this is a skill that they have, are being paid for, and can also um, continue to teach others. If we see people that look like us, um, or even just low income communities, if you see others that look like you doing the work in your community also, it feels more inclusive. It feels like it's for you and it feels like you belong. Um, and so that's why I think it's really key when it comes to um, making sure that farming is a, a part of a conversation for everyone and doesn't feel um, endeavors. Great. And Justin, how do you uh, see that materializing at PHS for creating more access and bringing communities together? Sorry, I was, I was chatting away. I was answering some questions in the chat, so my apologies. Um, yeah, access is an incredibly important thing. I think for starters, um, you know, one thing, community gardens can be very kind of insular in a lot of ways. Um, so one thing we, we've been advocating is, you know, community gardens really opening up to their neighborhoods, you know, hosting events, community events there and having information right there on the sidewalk where people can contact them. I think that's one of the most important thing. We, you know, I think in the last year, especially through COVID, we got a lot of inquiries about, oh, where, where's the nearest community garden? How can I become a member? And unfortunately, a lot of community gardens don't have that information public. So really trying to advocate for them to be more public spaces. Um, we talk a lot about how we need to reframe things and think of community gardens as part of the civic infrastructure, very much like we think of the park system. It needs to just become a norm and become incorporated into kind of how the city functions. Um, and, you know, Philadelphia is going through that process now. We've about two years ago embarked on an urban ag strategic plan. I know um, William Penn Foundation is helping support that. Um, so Parks and Recreation under the Director of Urban Agriculture, Ash, Ash Richards, is leading that in conjunction with Soil Generation and some other partners. So it's very exciting to see that the city's investing in this and is beginning to recognize how important community gardens are and just urban agriculture, I should say, um, to building a stronger, healthier city. Great. Um, and speaking of community, it's really uh, Carly at the heart of everything that you do. You're just mentioning, you know, how the uh, how your work at the People's Kitchen works and everything else. Um, what do you think we need to do to elevate not only the current but next generation to get involved in feeding our communities, you know, and how are you involving different community members? You know, you also were talking about the local chefs and the different, you know, people at the People's Kitchen. So can you please share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, my background's actually in group facilitation and I feel like that's kind of my answer to this. Like, I feel like so much happens in a group process. Like if, when I, when I was thinking about this question, like, I feel hesitant to say like education because we have something in mind about what traditional education looks like, but like this process of group conversation and what people bring to that and how we can like facilitate a space for them to actually take action on the things that they want in their own area. So, I mean, this garden is in Point Breeze, which is one of the most gentrified, gentrifying neighborhoods in the city. And so a lot of people are upset and angry. And this is an example of a green open land in that neighborhood. And also a physical space where we can meet COVID friendly and like have our hands in the dirt and have like simultaneous conversation about the social issues that are affecting us. So I sort of see this like parallel process happening of like, yeah, we're learning about growing, which I'm not a farmer, like I'm learning so much from the people at this garden. We're learning together, we have our hands in the soil, we're growing fresh ingredients for the kitchen. But then we're also like having very real conversations about what we wanna see, about the, the ways that we can have these green spaces in other neighborhoods, what we can do with this open land. I heard someone mentioning the land bank in the chat and how we can rethink community control of land. Um, and I think like when you think of a kitchen, something very similar happens because in the kitchen you have a dishwasher, you have a chef, you have the person coming up and picking up the meal. It's like this amazing space where really 
intense but important conversations happen. And I feel like anything we can do to allow that like real dialogue radiate out into the community that's a part of us and invite them into the process is what we're trying to do. Like we really are trying to eliminate that line of we are cooking, you're getting, and you're the, you know, like we have people who receive meals who are also cooks in our kitchen and just kind of removing that and like creating a fluid process of community dialogue. And I think that is um, that and community organizing and building collective power and change is how I see like our collective growth. Great. And in addition, to, uh, in addition to the social aspect that we're talking about, you know, with the communities around us, um, there's also a very big environmental impact. Whether you know our food is grown with chemicals that would obviously affect our communities in negative ways, leading to health problems, you know, potential adverse side effects. Um, so it's important to reduce the chemical inputs in our farming, and that obviously benefits the soil, the environment around us, the animals, the humans, all of the above. Um, so there's a really big buzz, and Emily I know, especially at Rodale, about regenerative, regenerative organic practices that also lead to a healthy planet and the people. So can you please explain how the foods that we choose have a positive impact around that, what that relates to the climate crisis? And I was talking about a little bit earlier in the intro about that. And also, I know we're so excited about water. Um, so what does that all have to do with each other when we're thinking about the food itself too? Yeah. I, so there is 15,000 farms in the Delaware watershed, which is an incredible number. It is, that is a huge number. And it's important to think about that everything that a farm does upstream from Philadelphia impacts downstream in Philadelphia. So every, every choice that a farmer is making up, upstream is actually making an impact into the neighborhoods, the communities, the backyards, the other farms um, in Philadelphia. And so, you know, every choice that we make um, as, a, as a consumer, we are also impacting, you know, what's happening downstream in these op in, in these communities. And so, um, you know, voting with your dollar is is kind of that terminology that's thrown around a lot. You know, making making sure that you're you as a consumer are making choices that are benefiting the community as a whole. And so, you know, one thing that is often talked about is just the fact that organic food is more expensive than um, conventional food. And, and that's a really tough conversation to have. And, you know, as, as somebody who sits kind of in the middle as a consultant, but as a consumer as well, you know, we have to recognize that the farmers who are growing organic foods, uh, they're implementing practices that are going to be more costly for them in certain scenarios. So they're implementing cover crops so that a seed is an extra cost to them. They might be doing a lot of hand weeding. So that's going to be extra labor cost to them. And so, you know, the cost of growing organic food um, is really representative in the cost of selling organic food. Um, and so, you know, the question becomes then, how do we support farmers? like Krista, who are making very, very conscious steps um, to reduce their impact on the environment while also impacting uh, or how to also addressing, you know, the consumer needs for um, good, healthy, nutrient dense, local, fresh food. Um, so I want to point out a couple of things, too, is that, you know, there is opportunity for local communities to support organic farmer, farmers um, that may be in a low income situation. So, you know, you can join a community garden and get your hands dirty and, and have that really big impact. And, you know, having Justin and Carly on this panel really showcases how a consumer can, can do it themselves, how they can make choices to grow food um, that, that is really impacting the environment like on the ground. Um, there's also lots of programs like Double Up Bucks and Farmer's Market that accept SNAP benefits where you can, you know, purchase food for 50% off or, you know, 30% off at Farmer's Market so you can get access to that high quality fresh product. And so, you know, it's just really important to think about the farming system as a whole that, you know, by potentially 
purchasing, you know, a non-organic product from a local grocery store, you know, you're making decisions that are potentially impacting the larger community as a whole. Um, but, you know, you also should be thinking about the long-term health effects of what it means to be in, in purchasing these products as well. So um, just conscious decisions of purchasing, you know, you're, you are voting every time you spend a dollar and, and you can be voting for, you know, a clean, uh, clean water, clean soil, um, and healthy practices. Great, and I was curious too, from Krista and Carly's perspective, um, you know, how we do try to combat some of those challenges of the cost of organic or how we start, you know, making it more accessible and, you know, just if your work is covering that or just how, what the challenges are. Um, I'll start. For me, it's definitely going to be being as close to the consumer as possible. Because not only when it comes to um, what, you're, what we're growing, if you are getting organic food, if you're purchasing it, yes, it's expensive, but you're not only just paying for the, the growing method of it being, you know, more costly, but you're also paying for the transportation of that too. So it, you know, and, and then what the transportation is also the, the increasing the carbon footprint that that product is having on the environment. So it really, for me, is bringing organic food as close to the consumers as possible and teaching the consumers how to grow their own food. Um, and if they don't want to put, you know, seeds in soil, or even, you know, learn another growing method, that's fine, but making sure they understand the importance of supporting their own local farms. Yeah, 100% yes to what Krista just said. I mean, even as we're meeting, like I'm meeting Krista through this panel and I'm like, ooh, I wonder how we can work together to feed people. Um, and I think the only way it's worked for us in the people's kitchen has been through relationship building. I know I keep saying that, but the only reason we have been able to grow in this farm is because of like a conversation and like figuring out that this was a need that we could do and then getting free food. Um, you know, the people we work with at the kitchen, like Ben and Christina from South Valley Barbacoa, like they've been able to make really great relationships with people sourcing products that they can get at a lower cost because honestly, the chefs in our crew are not gonna buy organic um, because they can't afford it right now, but they can once they start to meet people and they can find new ways and like kind of innovative ways to make it affordable for, for them, which is like people who are just growing it on their own, it seems to be. Um, but I think like part of our work is like sort of challenging challenging the system in general so that this can be accessible for more people, including our chefs. Um, and I think like a lot of chefs in our system are like kind of innovative in the same way that Krista is. And a lot of these farmers that are popping up in Philly, like by supporting these people and the people who are like really challenging what traditional farming looks like and showing us what farming can be in Philly, I think our chefs are doing the same thing. Like maybe they don't have a brick and mortar or maybe they don't do a traditional dine-in, but they have a pop-up where they're helping us think about the food system or they're working with a local farmer to create a plate that goes back to the people's kitchen. Um, so I think like we can th think collectively around innovative ways to bring organic produce and things into our um, kitchens, but it, it is a challenge and barrier that we need to work through together. Yeah, it's a great point. And especially, you know, I was going to say, I feel like the looming challenge that we all have right now is this pandemic that we've had for the past year, um, whether that's economical challenges. Um, you know, I was going to say, I think, interestingly enough, a lot of us have been embracing the outside and outdoors uh, because, you know, people don't, you know, even though we have to be holed up in our house oftentimes, just that escape to the outdoors, maybe connecting with nature, whether that's going for hikes. Um, people perhaps going to uh, be outdoors for gardening. How do you think the past year and the pandemic have impacted this conversation and what your work is? I'm not, you know, whoever wants to tackle that one. Is it benefiting? Is it challenging? Yeah, I mean, I, the demand is out there. I mean, that's the good thing. I think, you know, if you're in the business of, you know, supporting urban agriculture, this is a good time for you. Um, you know, but 
the supply isn't there. So, I'm, you know, again, I'm going back to community gardens. So many people want to, you know, get in the ground, want to start growing their own food because they saw, you know, when the pandemic hit, the shelves in the grocery stores were empty. People were like, the light went off and they're like, okay, I need to be a little bit more self-reliant, self-sufficient. So, you know, increasing the number of community gardens out there um, at PHS, we pivoted a little bit and poured additional resources and staffing to create what we called Harvest. And it was all about educating people on how to grow their own food. Um, so we had, I don't know how many thousand people participate that. And then those individuals were then, we helped supported them to figure out how to donate their food um, and how to you know share their food with their neighbors, guidelines on how to do that in the time of COVID. So we definitely saw a lot of that and we're actually gonna hope to continue that moving forward because we don't see this ending. I think people consider this as a norm now in terms of like having to grow your own, own food, being more self-reliant, um, self-sufficient. So yeah, I think this is kind of the new wave. Um, I can add that I, from in, like my perspective in the organizing context, um, COVID-19 highlighted a hunger emergency, uh, but I would say like this was happening well before COVID, um, but we're seeing COVID highlight it, COVID showing the inequality that already exists before COVID and before this pandemic, and now we're moving into a space where I think people are thinking about it more. Um, and that's been really cool. Like I was just on the phone with True Love Seeds last week and there was like a back order because they said there's so many people ordering seeds and kind of thinking about food. And I think COVID has created so many innovative strategies. Like there's, a, you know, we have the people's kitchen. We're one thing, but I've seen so many amazing ways that people are trying to figure out feeding people people are trying to figure out growing food for people and also just challenging the high cost of food in general. You know, we're thinking like, why can't people have free chef cooked quality meals every day? Like, why is this commodified this way? So um, I think COVID has like, has presented some really innovative conversations while showing the really bad systematic inequality that we already had. I was going to say too, I know there's been a really big reinsurgence uh, of CSAs because I mean, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I've been doing CSAs for the past like five or six or eight years or something, and I could barely sign up for one last year. Um, so I was curious, Chris, I know you have a CSA, um, you know, how have you seen the impacts and is that, yeah, like do you see more excitement? What's going on? Um, yeah, definitely. When I decided that I wanted to do a CSA, we, I mean, we had an overwhelming support. I started it a small CSA was my first one. It was only 10 families and right in my neighborhood in Germantown. And it was, it was awesome. You know, people were like super on board and I'm like, oh yeah, you're growing things. Like, let's, let me, let me get that. Like they were really um, wanting to not just support the agriculture because that's the thing. Like a lot of people don't understand that but they wanted to support me. So it was like, okay, now you support me. Now I have uh, now I have a platform to be able to tell you why this is so important. And that's what's con been continuing to happen. Um, so now our CSA is 60 members. And and it's great because we get to you know provide produce that is hyper organic because I, I was the conversation with Emily that I had earlier this week. She's like, are you using anything? And I'm like, absolutely nothing. <laughs> because I want to make sure that you know, I'm not making any mistakes. I want to make sure it's absolutely organic. And so we are going to be more labor intensive. Like, yes, we are looking if there's an aphid, we're looking for cabbage worms and we're picking them off by hand. We're doing the work um, instead of using any type of pesticides, herbicides or anything. And um, while I am grateful for the information that we don't have, to, it doesn't have to be that hard. Um, I just feel like, you know, I want it to be as excellent as possible and as nutrient dense as possible. That's what's key. So yeah, so people, me being able to, to share my story and, and helping people understand that growing food is not as difficult as it may seem or as, you know, you can do it simply in your own home. And so for another huge part of what Farmer John is doing is providing education and coming into the spring, we'll be um, focusing on city folks that have, you know, little to no land or just some concrete in front of their porch or steps and um, teaching about container gardening, like how you can grow, you know, a ton of potatoes and carrots and onions 
um, in some buckets from Home Depot, like things like that. We want to, you know, empower people in those ways, because even if you're not going to be a member of a community garden, um, or like I mentioned before, I really want to start the conversation of having gardens on every other corner or supporting some type of radius that supports a number of people where it's staffed by the people that live in the neighborhood. Um, but yeah, like it's just making sure people understand that it's doable. So these CSAs, it, it really, they, to me, when they're in the city and when the food's coming from inside the city, it helps to jumpstart conversations about how you can be doing it yourself and the importance of supporting your local farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I was gonna say, Chris brought up such a good point too between whether you're um, able to grow in a container, whether you have some land, like Justin was saying, with community gardens or other resources. So I'm curious for Emily too. Um, you know, I know Rodale is so customer and also farmer focused. So what do you think about this piece of the conversation? Yeah, I I guess I want to emphasize the CSA model because we've been talking about it a lot and. Um, Again, because I am so farmer focused, for me, it's about finding models that work for both the consumer and the grower. And the CSA model is such an incredible model because, you know, there and there's so many different ways to to change it that can meet the needs of of the farmer and of the consumer. So, you know, Krista offers a CSA and what this allows for Krista to do is to manage your cash flow a lot more effectively um, because you know you're getting that payment up front and that supports the farm. Um, some CSAs offer sliding scale CSAs so if you're in a low income area and you want access to that food um, but maybe you can't pay for that up front, up front um, you know dollar amount that it maybe can be lower for low income families but for you know higher income families families, they can pay more. And that is a really cool model that allows um, access for everybody. You know, it's very equitable. Um, another model that I think is really interesting is the model we have at Rodale, which is um, instead of it being a CSA, we call it an ASC, so an agriculture supported community. So we feel, you know, why are the farmers not supporting the community? Like why, why aren't we growing food that, that, su that supports the, the community? And so um, we've changed our model just slightly to a allow for um, people to access that. So it's a pay for week uh, by week. So if there's weeks that potentially you can't pay, um, then you're not locked into this huge amount up front. And so, um, you know, there's that model itself is really, really great for both parties and, um, you know, how we can increase access to that. So good, healthy food, fresh food, and uh, food that's good for the environment, food that's sequestering carbon, um, but then also that supporting an economy for a farmer, um, but supporting the health of the consumer. So really just, you know, amazing opportunities for partnerships among um, the consumer and the farmer. Yeah, and I think another great benefit of the CSA is that also Emily was, you know, talking about is besides the fresh food, you also may be introduced to new foods. Um, so I remember when I first got a rutabaga or some other things, I'm like, I don't know what this is or what to do. Um, and some CSAs will give you recipes or you can just Google really fun ways to incorporate new foods that, um, you know, will lead you to new discoveries. Um, so speaking of food and experimentation, I know um, Carly, obviously you're working with a lot of restaurants and chefs. So how do you think the impact is about sourcing healthy food from organic farmers, you know, on a chef level, from restaurant level, um, with your kitchen, beanie kitchen? Yeah, I, I, I use this example a lot. I think I already shared this with the panelists, but our kitchen is like Chopped, the TV show, because we take seconds from farms. We take stuff from our farm. We are connected to restaurants who will just give us extra loaves of bread. So literally the chefs who are brilliant and creative will come into the kitchen with the team, which also is like students, culinary students, things like that. And they look at the thing and they're like, okay, this is what we have. This is what we're going to make today. And they make an amazing meal. Um, so I think, I mean, I think I already was kind of getting into this around. It's It's been a lot about the just slow. I mean, everything feels pressing right now and intense, but there is this part about slow relationship building and like getting to know each other that's led so how we've been able to connect and source the foods in our kitchen. Um, I mean, I think like directly supporting farmers like Krista actually supports us because then we can have 
you know, we can meet amazing farmers like Krista who could then, you know, are supporting the food system. And by supporting the food system, our kitchen has more access to fresh ingredients that then can go to people who are food insecure and don't have free food or don't have food. Um, so I really see this like as something that's way more zoomed out than just our kitchen. I mean, I think our kitchen's like chopped and this is what we're doing, but then there's like this zoomed out picture of um, just looking at why in the richest country in the world are people food insecure at all. And we know that there's fresh food and there's organic farmers and how can we make that connection? Um, so I think we're just, we're doing it by hyper localizing the food system and growing ingredients in the farm cooking them and then bringing them back to the same neighborhood. But I think there's a lot of ways that we can think together, um, zoom out and keep making these links. I think another important link, uh, thanks for Carly for drawing that link as well. Um, it's something that we may not think about with farming all the time, but also thinking about water because you know, there's a, uh, it's a free resource in a lot of ways, but that's actually one of the things that experts think might be the next resource that could be commodified or, you know, have struggles with, you know, lack of water in the West, especially with wildfires and problems that a lot of our food is grown in California, unfortunately. Um, why we're having this conversation and bring, bring it all back to Philly and the surrounding Pennsylvania area, right? Support PA farmers. Um, for, so Justin, being for, with PHS, I'm curious how Philadelphia is approaching water and farming um, and just kind of how some of those connections are, you know, being drawn. Yeah, great question. And there's been a few things in the chat about rain barrels, rain collection here in Philadelphia. And I was recommending the rain check program that it's run through um, Philadelphia Water Department. We help partner with them so residents can get subsidized rain barrels. But going back to that question, um, yeah, the Philadelphia Water Department created an urban agriculture guide. Um, so the four, yeah, that is intended to kind of help farmers, urban ag producers, you know, navigate the complex world of how to access water, what to do. Um, you know, if you're tapping a hydrant, the number one thing is to always have a backflow preventer. People don't realize that you can recontaminate the water source. Um, unfortunately, backflow preventers aren't the cheapest thing. So that, again, we go back to this question of accessibility. You know, you have a $400 piece of equipment, not everyone can access that. So how can we offer those things to the masses? Um, so that's important. Um, and I think the water department has also canceled um, stormwater fees for production sites. Um, they find they recognize this was a few years back, but you know, through a lot of advocacy, PHS was part of it, Neighborhood Gardens Trust, there are no multiple organizations that were part of this advocacy to get PWD to stop charging stormwater fees on urban ag sites because if, as people know, we have a combined sewer system here and you know, these farms are doing the city a service by absorbing or offsetting some of the water going back into the um, combined sewer system. So, you know, little by little, PWD has been doing stuff, the city has been doing stuff, and we hope to see more policies around this, especially once, you know, the urban ag strategic plan is complete. Great. And I know there was also a really cool, simple innovation that Krista had with snow and water recently. So I'd like you to share, you know, even how you can take some of these, uh, you don't have, you know, obviously we're talking about rain barrels and if you have, um, you know, space for that in your house or whatever that is, that's great. But what can you do even, Krista, what are some things you've done with water? Um, well, my farming experience really started in my backyard in my four by six greenhouse uh, after I came home from that vacation a few months after. Um, I was gifted this greenhouse, got it put together and it's really awesome. Um, just this past week of all the snow that we had, I went out in my backyard to, to get some water and my faucet was frozen on the outside of the house. So I couldn't actually turn it. So I wasn't going to be able to get anything out. And I was like, okay, y'all definitely need water because inside the greenhouse is about 60 to 70 degrees typically. And so I'm like, all right, you're dry. I could go in the house and get water, but I'm like, let me, I'm like, we're surrounded by snow out here. I'm just decided to take scoops full of snow. Uh, I actually had it in my um, garden water, but also I took a tote of it as well and just let it melt inside my greenhouse and use that water uh, to, you know, to go ahead and water my plants, which to me just, it made the most perfect sense. And when it dawned on me, I was like, this is what I'm gonna do. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I love it because it's, you know, recycling the water. I know we have a big focus of Green Philly is always talking about recycling and how we can just simplify things and not necessarily, you know, sustainability might look like these things you might see on Instagram and people buying these expensive contraptions to try to go zero waste, but it doesn't even have to be that complicated. You can just use what's in your backyard, whether that's snow, whether you don't have a huge rain barrel, but just a bucket, you know, there's different ways you can be innovative and that's what we're constantly trying to do overall, right? Um, so I am curious to Krista, um, what are some ways to connect with farmers who value these growing practices that we've discussed or, you know, how do um, people support you? Could you explain some more about that? Sure. Um, you know, huge thing for us is our volunteer days and which right now it's just on Wednesdays, but we plan to increase those even more so, um, as we get into the spring and the better weather because that allows people to come and learn too. And we're at our farm, not to say anything bad about any other farms, but I do a really, it's a huge focus of mine to um, try to decrease monotonous tasks as much as possible. Uh, I've volunteered at a number of farms and the, most of the time they send you to weeding uh, every time you go. And so I try to avoid that as much as possible. When people come to visit us, I do want it to be an experience for them uh, and that they can take away something a skill that they could, you know, go home and duplicate if they so choose. Um, but yeah, that's what's really important to us is that we want to make sure that, you know, you're when you come out to us that you leave with something that you can go home and, you know, on the road again on our mission of people knowing how to grow for themselves. Great. And Carly, what do you think are some of the resources in the Philadelphia area who are the cutting edge of this work? Um, and why do you also think it's important to understand the full cycle of where our food comes from? Yeah, totally. Um, I was actually, I was realizing in the chat, I was responding to all panelists. So sorry to everyone who didn't see my responses to your questions. But one thing I was saying that um, the advocacy Justin discussed around the stormwater application is something that we've directly benefited from at the garden. Um, because honestly, these conversations around clean water are not exactly the frame that we have because we're thinking how can we get water how can we pay the water bill um and then we find these things that have people have fought for like the stormwater application and then we're able to then you know have the garden the way we want um but i want to make sure i answer your question julie <laughs> um i think looking at the Oh, so, you know, some other resources, like, um, I think really thinking about the seeds that we're ordering has been really important to us. Like the, actually our seed list for this growing season came from the kitchen. They were like, we want to see like these things, these ingredients would be really cool if we could try to do that this year, let's go for it. And some of them are really unique um, and not easy to find. And that's been a fun experiment for us, but we've had a great, um, experience working with local seed companies so true love seeds was a really great partner um so we're like seeing right there like okay starting in seed what does this local process look like so it looked like a conversation where i was learning oh that's a cool thing that the kitchen wanted to get that but that's probably not going to grow well here or um actually you don't really need to buy our seeds why don't you just get that at the get an organic one at the grocery store have some volunteers grow it and then have it grow at the garden after that. So I think like we are trying to learn every day, but like also zoom out and look at the whole process locally. Um, I hope that answered your question, Julie. <laughs> it was great. I mean, I don't, even if you go off, off the uh, tangent, I was gonna say, I, I'm just so excited about this conversation. I'm like, I remember my first question was, um, and speaking of resources, I know Emily at Rodale, I had the awesome uh, pleasure of coming to Rodale last August, I want to say, for like the farm tour and really got to see a lot of this in action. Um, you know, and I think the awesome part about the mission is you're educating the farmers of how to incorporate some of these practices. Um, as a consumer, I obviously know the Rodale brand and, you know, just the um, information that you give to everyone. So what do you think are some of the resources that Rodale can do? Because I know it may seem far away, it cuts down or, um, you know, and it's, it's really not that far from Philly, right? It's an hour out. So like, how is the upstream, how is your work impacting? What can people gain from Rodale? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we 
work with any farmer. So, you know, that is an urban farmer, that is a rural farmer, that is a grain farmer, that's a vegetable farmer, a livestock farmer. So we, as the consulting team, we can offer free consulting to anybody. And so um, I saw a couple chats come through about, you know, what cover crop is the best cover crop for me? Where can I source these seeds? And these are the questions we would be happy to answer. Um, and I'm happy to answer during the Q&A session as well. But, you know, it really comes down to one of the things that I, farmers farmers have continually shown through research that they need is an on the ground trusted advisor so that they can ask these questions and uh, implement these practices and so that's where you know our team really serves is that you know how how can I make this sort of impact on my farm in particular because it's not a one-size-fits-all approach you know regenerative agriculture is not one-size-fits-all it's not a prescription it's really a unique practices that need to be changed depending on what what the layout of the farm is, what resources the farm has. Um, so that's that's on the farmer side. On the consumer side, I would highly encourage all, all the Philly residents to check out the Grow Clean Water Initiative. Um, we're going to be having an Earth Day event um, in, in Philly uh, on Earth Day. So uh, there's lots of opportunities for consumers and farmers alike to be engaging in the resources that Rodales offers. Um, our website is a plethora of knowledge. I, I get lost on it sometimes just clicking through links and um, all of our webinars, uh, you know, some of, I should say some of our webinars are free and we also have a virtual campus um, that uh, offers educational resources as well to consumers and uh, farmers. Awesome. And I've been so excited about this conversation, all this different knowledge that you're all bringing. Um, you know, as Green Philly, I, or as like, you know, the founder face of Green Philly, I started the website because my employer was taking our recycling bins and throwing them into the trash cans. And I was like, oh my God, like it was 2008, it was RecycleGate 2008 as I deemed it in the meantime, um, or since then, because, you know, it was just a simple act of my employer taking our recycling bins and throwing them into the trash cans that I was traumatized by. And I'm like, recycling should be easy. People should understand this. Ironically, Philadelphia is still throwing our recycling in the trash. It's a whole other story, not for this conversation. Um, but the reason why I say that is because no matter whether you are starting your sustainability journey, um, there's obviously people in the chat who have been saying, you know, they're getting involved in community gardens. They want to take back vacant fields or vacant lots, you know, to grow gardens. No matter what you can do, whether you're a gardener, whether you never looked, uh, thought about gardening before, maybe you just want to support the local system. I think there are changes all of us um, on you know, the virtual Zoom room can take as a consumer, as a community member, community leader, educators, advocate, um, you know, advocates, gardeners, all these people, right? So there are so many of these huge topics, but I really want to take it back to that making sustainability easy, accessible, and low cost, right? So what are some simple steps for a lightning round? So in like 30 seconds to a minute for each of the panels before we go to Q&A. What is one or two basic steps we can each take no matter where we are in our journey? So I don't know who wants to start that. I'll start. <laughs> um, compost. Let's start by creating a closed loop cycle. Um, in Philly, you know, there is food waste and food waste can be turned into a nutrient and that nutrient grows crops. So, you know, that is a very, very simple way in your own backyard, finding a local composting facility to really close the loop on, on waste and turn it into something that feeds your body. Great. Carly, do you wanna go? Oh, I was trying to think of some good ones. <laughs> um, I was thinking actually about removing some of the barriers and social norms that prevent us from having like one off conversations from people who are at the produce stand or at a farm around the block and just allowing ourselves to talk to them and find out more and see how we can support them directly um, and see what they're thinking about this topic, because I think that leads to new paths that we can create together. Um, also like supporting projects like ours that are doing this type of work. Like, I think, you know, we're launching a sustainer campaign. There's lots of things that um, could use some really supportive people, like all of the attendees here um, in, in supporting our projects and also co-creating with us and imagining a new food system together. I love it. I love that, Carly. And Krista? Yes. 
Um, huge thing for me is always going to be like a main thing that I'm preaching is um, devaluing free specifically for neighborhoods and for low income neighborhoods like ones I live in and um, black and brown communities um, devaluing free there's such an emphasis on you know giving things for free and, and and these food banks that have low nutrient foods very nutrient deficient foods that um, are in them and so forth um, opportunity is much greater than anything you can give someone for free and so what I would like to see in our in these neighborhoods is again you know increasing the ways to increase the knowledge about growing food yourself or increasing access to farms which means putting actual micro farms in neighborhoods where this nutrient dense food is going to be um, most beneficial where all the the health disparities do exist you have to bring it directly to people and um, teaching them the importance of it and how to do it is really what's going to help reverse uh, all the, you know, the terrible thing that's going on with our food system currently. Great. And Justin? Wow. Um, so many different things. Um, you know, take advantage of all those plastic receptacles you have, then you recycle and convert them into growing, you know, herbs. It's easy. Everyone, I always hear people complain, oh, I don't have a green thumb. We all have a green thumb. Don't worry about it. And you might fail a few times, but again, that's part of life, you know, troubleshoot. Um, so take advantage of that. I know Krista mentioned, you know, the garbage cans, this and that. Garbage cans are great for growing potatoes. Just they love depth. So fill that gar old garbage can with some soil and dirt and throw your potatoes in there and grow a bunch. Um, and then what Emily said about composting, you know, take it to the next step, get some worms. Kids love worms. Like these are all things you can involve your family in, um, neighbors, just there's so much you could do. So, yeah. Julie, can I add one? Of course. Um, I was thinking, I have to say this, this is like the work I do, but like working together for systematic change and looking at policies. I mean, I think the, for example, the fight for at Standing Rock for clean water, that directly connects to our fight for clean water here in Philly. Like, I think we can look together um, at the policies that are impacting our ability to have access. That's great. I have one last one, Julie, too. Sorry, oh, real quick. It. And it's going to be food scraps. Um, also, if people don't understand that you can take food scraps and you can regrow food, um, such as potato, you know, ends of potatoes or even some, even parts of onions and things like that, uh, carrots, a lot of roots, um, you can regrow. So not always being so quick to throw things away. That's a great point, Krista. And uh, I know a lot of people have also gotten into uh, houseplants. I was going to say my little leaf right behind me in this my office right now, but um, you can also use some food scraps for plants and uh, enhancing your soil too. So even if it's the eggshells or coffee grounds, et cetera, so you can do that as well. Um, and I'm really glad, you know, just as this conversation, we've all been talking about the importance of supporting our local farmers and everything else, but that's actually also one of our biggest zero waste or waste to reduce your trash and overall um, thing, right? Because if you're going to your farmer's markets or getting a CSA, you're going to reduce the amount of uh, miles they're traveling to you, you mean, meaning the farmers or your food will have more nutrients. Um, you'll also not have to necessarily have all the plastic packaging that comes from grocery stores if it's being shipped from California. Um, so the more you can make those decisions as an individual, and then you're also supporting the amazing group and all the people that we're talking about on this panel, whether it's you know the farmers, um, the local communities, et cetera. So with that, I do want to get to the Q&A. So I know we've had some questions in the chat. Um, so I'm going to be reading some of them. And uh, thank you to everyone who's been submitting the questions. Please uh, continue to submit them. So first, um, someone did ask Justin specifically to speak to Chris's point about how organizations like, like PHS are providing jobs and trainings. Um, in farming and to neighbors living um, around vacant lots in the city. So can you share some of the programs and resources that people could use? Sure. Um, so in terms of jobs, workforce development, we, we offer one called um, Roots to Reentry. So it's for returning citizens where we train them in landscaping horticulture and then partner them with landscaping businesses for internships. So um, that's one area. Um, what was the other question? I'm sorry, Julie. 
No worries. Um, how does PHS provide jobs and trainings? I'm also looking at the questions as well. Um, and also about um, vacant, some people are asking about vacant lots. So, you know, what can you, can you turn a vacant lot into a farm? How do you like, what's the process like? What is that connection? Well, I need an hour for that. So <laughs> um, I would say first go to vacant land 215. I don't know when the next meeting is, but people can email me. That's a great, opportunity. I know there's representatives from the Public Interest Law Center, um, as well as Neighborhood Gardens Trust, Soil Generation, um, PHS, we're all on there. And that's a great time for people to ask questions when it comes to land access. Um, it's complicated, especially in a city like Philadelphia that is experiencing a development boom, and it's very challenging. Um, so yeah, so a lot to get into, and I don't want to open that up, but Bacon Land 215, or you can reach out to me directly. Great, thanks, Justin. And for Krista, there are a couple of questions as well. Um, sorry, I the person's name. I did. I haven't grown anything, but I believe that food sovereignty. I believe in food sovereignty for our communities. How does a young Black Philly native get involved in urban farming and agriculture? And is it possible for me to grow food and work full time? Okay. Um, first question: How do you get involved? Uh, the best thing to do is to um connect with the farm i think when you connect with farms you're really connecting with the farmer first so see if you know see what farms are are willing to connect with you also that was a one difficulty i had when i first got into the industry and you know, i was wanting to volunteer at as many farms as possible and some people are receptive and some aren't so that's just the reality so you want to um you know find out what farms are local to you easy for you to get to and ones that are willing for you to come. You can always come to Farmer John. We have volunteer days listed on our website. Um, uh, and Wednesdays is the current day, but we will be increasing that as, uh, as the season progresses. And what was the second question? Julie? I committed the cardinal sin of keeping myself on mute. Apologies. <laughs> I was saying, sorry, the second part of the question from Stephen was, is it possible for me to grow food and work full time? Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. Um, it's super simple, honestly. Like, if you wanted to either start growing from food scraps or growing from actual seed, but literally just challenge yourself, get yourself a little pot, not even something big, just start with something small. Um, and I would say grab some lettuce seeds and put them in the dirt and just, you know, so lightly, lightly water them and just let them go and you'll get some gratification. You need to see gratification first so that you know you can do it. Um, and that's really how I started. I'm like, let me put some seeds in the dirt, water it. And like a couple of days later, you know, you'll get some germination, which is you'll start to see some green. And then you're like, okay, I can do this. So you can totally, you know, grow things um, simply. There's some 30 day crops. There's some even 18, 18 day uh, stacks of radish is one of my favorite vegetables to grow. Um, where you, if you like radish, you'll be able to, you know, get those pretty quickly. So absolutely, you can have a full time job and grow a garden for yourself. You don't even need a lot of space. Um, but I would love to connect with anyone who has questions like that to really learn how you can be container gardening at your, no matter how small or big of a size you have. I love it. Kristen, I know we're on like, I don't know, February 27th. Is there stuff that people could be planting now? Or should they wait? I know it's like, you know, right between, right before we're hitting spring oh, yeah. coming soon. Yeah, I mean, outside of what the weather is doing, you can still grow a lot of things inside your own home um, by a sunny window. Like just what I was speaking about, like you can totally grow some lettuce and kale. Um, get those started now and that's the best thing to do so that when the ground is workable when it when the frost is over or the um the risk of frost is over you can you know take what you've grown your little pots and you you what you've created is what we call transplants which you're able to take outside and put them in some uh prepared earth and watch them grow to maturity so there's a number of things you can grow i mean there's a full list um and if you also, if you want to, to know exactly what those things are, you can simply Google to um, spring crops or cold weather crops or even um, cold hardy crops. Uh, look at that and also look at some warm, but warm crops like tomatoes and cucumbers, which you can also get started now. So yes, and the, the opportunities are endless for growing food. It really is. It's really, it's more simple than 
we know, um, and I didn't know any of this until, you know, a few years ago when I got, when I first started. So there is hope. If, if, if I am a example of that 100% that there's hope to learn uh, everything you need to know with the help of other people like wonderful Emily, <laughs> other seasoned farmers, um, but you can grow a plethora of food at home with little to no real knowledge of it just to get started, yeah. Great. I know I was going to say, I'll have to start planting my seeds soon enough, right? Um, all right. And the next question comes from Brooke. And uh, I think this is probably for Emily. Do you have the research results for each cover crop and what is best for the different crops? Yeah. So cover crop selection is one of those things that's very, very site specific. Um, since we're talking to kind of in the urban focus, I would say that look for cover crops that you can kind of use for multiple fashions. So um, one of those opportunities uh, could be, you could use a, um, a pea as a cover crop. It fixes uh, nitrogen, it's a nice legume, but you could also harvest the peas and use them um, for an edible fashion. Same goes for tillage radishes. Those are planted during the winter time. You can harvest tillage radishes and you can eat them. So, you know, it really, it really depends on the site, when, what time of the year you're trying to grow your cover crop um, in Pennsylvania because we have kind of a short season. Um, if you're growing all the way until November, cereal rye is always a great option for a cover crop. Um, so yeah, call me if you wanna know which cover crop might work best for your system. <laughs> That's great. Um, and Yvonne asked also in the Q&A, um, and I think this is important, especially being a Philadelphia and thinking about different contaminants in the history of Philly with factories and all these other things that like lead that could be in our soil. I know the Enquirer and other publications have had some, you know, uh, stories about that over the past couple of years. So what about soil testing for contaminants in gardens and urban areas? Um, who tests them? Are there state sites or orgs or businesses and who do we contact? I think Justin, maybe, I think you mentioned something in the chat below to make sure we cover that in this part too. No, Emily did too. Um, so yeah, Penn State um, for local. I said in the chat, no offense to Penn State, but we always do our soil testing through University of, Am University of Massachusetts Amherst because they include lead in their soil testing and it's cheaper. Um, but yeah, that is the most important thing anyone can do if they're growing in the soil in Philadelphia is get your soil tested beforehand. There's a strong likelihood there will be trace elements of lead. And then we also recommend always building on top of the soil. Um, so building raised beds, you know, get some lumber, you know, non-pressure treated lumber. Um, you could get some, you know, through parks and rec, you get a number of different ways to lumber, but, you know, building the raised beds and building on top of the soil. Um, and then we do offer soil testing for community gardens. We usually buy bulk soil tests through University of Amherst, um, and then we can give those out to individuals. Great. Um, and I was also going to mention, since uh, we still have a few minutes of Q&A, but some people are asking also for the contact information for the panelists. So if you could actually share your email or a website that people can find out more as we're going through Q&A, that would be great. So they can check that in the chat. Um, so our next question, you can type that verbally, I'm sure, uh, or type it, not verbally. Type is different than verbal. Um, Carolina asks, hi, Carly, are there initiatives or programs for college students on urban farming and agricultural lit literacy? But I think also maybe um, some other panelists could answer that too. Sure. Um, yeah, and we're like constantly trying to find more paths for students to get involved in our work. A lot of the students that work with us actually have kind of come naturally, like their families receive meals or they're in the neighborhood, but we are partnered with Penn State Center Philadelphia and have connected to some Penn State students who are doing, actually one group's a social movement student group. So they're entering and in, invested in social movements and like thinking about how food connects to that. Another one is um, interested in food, they're a part of a food decision research lab um, but these students are learning while doing. So they're they're actually taking like a community-based participatory action approach um, to their research. So they're working with students in Philly to together design models that are working for the neighborhood as opposed to like coming in and saying, this is how we should do it. Um, and we also work with students from the Careers for Culinary Arts program, which is recent alum from Philly public schools who are interested in culinary 
education, but we're enhancing it by trying to have them come to the garden and see the whole food system. So like those are paths that we have in our people's kitchen, but I feel like like any ways that we can get students involved in getting their hands in the dirt and also thinking together about the food system is great. So I'd love if you reached out and we could think about more. Great. Any other panels want to speak to that by chance before I move into the next question? Oh, I should, there's like a quite a few um, apprenticeship programs. One of our, like a Penny Pack Farm has given us a lot of seconds and been an amazing partner. I know they had an apprenticeship opening recently. Just want to plug that. Awesome. I should also plug that we at Rodale have a ton of educational opportunities, um, high school students, college students, um, veterans as well. So um, we offer a ton of internships and apprentices, apprenticeships. So you can check that out on our uh, website as well. Awesome. Um, speaking of water, which is another theme throughout today's um, discussion, are there veggies that are sensitive to tap water? Um, someone saying that they have house plants, sorry, it's Lisa, that can't tolerate fluoride or other um, chloramines. I think that's what it, the word is. Uh, so I know that plants love rainwater, but do you need to filter tap water? What do you do about water and growing plants for food? I'll mention some. Then real quick, I even at home, I think it's important to filter your water while I am an avid tap uh, water drinker and have been my entire life. It's what we like to call school kill punch. Um, I do, uh, I know there is a bunch of stuff in there that probably shouldn't be going in my body. So uh, I want to make sure that my veggies are as nutrient dense as possible. So I always, um, I actually invest in a water filter that I attach right to my my hose, and we do the same thing at the at the greenhouse as well. Um, but it's I use a brand called um, Boogie. Is actually what it's called, but it's right on uh, like Amazon, and I'm sure there's other ways that others can speak to. But that's the way that I do it for for home. Oh, Chris, I think you're muted. I muted, I just muted myself. It, it was all that missed? Uh, just like the last minute or so. Oh, a minute, that was a long time. Um, so after the school, school co punch bit. Oh. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, there is a, a water filtration system. It's um, it attaches directly to your hose or to your uh, to your faucet at home. And um, I use a brand that's called Boogie. It's on Amazon. It's about fifty dollars, but it lasts for quite a long time, especially for home gardening. It'll get you through your entire season, and um, that's a good way to um, filtrate the water and um, help with anything that's that's in it that you don't want in your bed. Um, so we're seeing what other questions we currently have. Um, where do you buy non-GMO seeds? Uh, who has an answer for that or resources? We can talk a little bit about that. Um, so it's important to point out that um, as far as commercially avail available GMO seeds, that's really only a concern with a couple of crops. Um, there is commercially available uh, GMO squash seeds, um, and then from like a grain crop perspective, corn, soy, alfalfa. Um, so as far as finding seeds that are non-GMO, it's going to be fairly easy. Uh, you want to be looking not only for non-GMO seeds, but also um, if you are purchasing organic seeds, 
that's a great option. Um, and untreated seeds, so making sure they don't have any fungicides or coppers on the outside as well. You can find them in a lot of different places in urban areas going to just a local um, agricultural store. They're going to have lots of different options. If you're buying on a larger scale, um, you can find um, high mowing seeds. It offers organic untreated seeds and um, Johnny's is another great option as well for uh, local organic seeds. And I, I'll just add another plug. I know Carly's mentioned them several times, but again, True Love Seeds. In fact, they work with a lot of local farmers here. They work with some community gardens that we um, support um, to grow out some very interesting, unique tomatoes. Um, Hudson Valley Seed Company up in New York, they're great to work with, Experimental Farm Network. So there's a lot of smaller seed companies out there that are doing some really interesting heirloom products, local um, types of seeds. Great. Um, oh, sorry, Carly, go for it. Well, I was just, I saw another question by um, Lindsay and I feel like it connected to this because um, Lindsay was asking about if anyone, like if people don't know what to do with the fresh ingredients that you're making, like how do you kind of address that? Um, and I think like the, in the seed process, like thinking about what's culturally relevant and actually, or just like relevant to people. And I know PHS has done an amazing job providing culturally relevant seedlings to our farm and true love, you know, providing um, assistance and thinking about that. And I feel like that's a really important part of the conversation in order to actually be providing the ingredients that actually work for people and they know what to do with. And then there's also really innovative and creative ways that people are supporting people in thinking about the recipes. I think that someone mentioned that there's some folks and in maybe including Krista who do some videos around how to cook with the ingredients. One of our chefs who's also an organizer at two and five working to end mass incarceration. He does this cook that John video series or has done and like shows people what to do with the share food boxes. So I think there's like really cool things that people are coming up with to help uh, draw a link between like what we're growing and how we can cook with it. And I'd be excited to think of more ways together. That's awesome. Uh, well, it's been an absolutely amazing conversation, and I just want to thank all the panels that have been here uh, today, sharing their awesome knowledge. Uh, the Rodale Institute, uh, as I mentioned, they're going to also have a one-question survey in the chat that you can answer as well. Um, on the last note, and thank you all to the audience members for the engaging Q&A, what you've been sending, your questions you've been asking. It's been awesome to read. Um, trying to keep up with it all between, you know, all your awesome conversations. Um, so I would like to ask each panelist as we wrap up, what is one takeaway and like a sentence or something that you would like to share with the audience? And also, um, I know I asked you if you could put some stuff in the chat, but also just how to um, get more information, whether that's a resource you have, um, a way to contact you. We could go around um, as we wrap up one last time. Sure, I can kick it off. So um, just the uh, really the focus of healthy soil, which equals healthy food, which equals healthy water, which equals healthy people and um, making sure that everybody always remembers that, you know, they're supporting a farmer three to five times a day if you like snacks <laughs> um, uh, with every day. So um, just remembering that each of the choices you make it, um, as purchasing decisions is connected to clean water. It's connected to clean soil. Uh, I'll chime in. Um, health care is really important to me as well. I mean, it's just it's been my life's work before I jumped into farming and now it's all encompassed together. So I want to encourage people to focus on um, decreasing health disparities also. And it starts with what you also are purchasing at home as well. Encouraging farmers to uh, grow organically and growing regeneratively is going to have a, a direct correlation to um, what they're able to sell and what the supply and demand is, the economics around farming and around what people are eating. Um, and so it's important for 
for organic food to even see a price shift, we have to start putting more emphasis on, on the importance of it and less importance um, on conventional foods. And so that's my that's my takeaway. It's just how you know focus on what you are buying. Again, it chimes into what Emily just said too. Is, and let's um, make a huge push for and and an easy for ease for farmers to be able to grow organically and it be more cost effective for everyone. I can go next. Thanks, Justin. Um, I'm thinking about that we. We together are greater than the sum of our parts. And I think that food work and food systems and um, urban farming shows that more than anything else, what we can do when we do things together and collectively. And we also live in a system and we live in an environment. So the things that we do have an impact on that system and environment. And then, but we can also look out at that and see how is this not working for us? How are these systems that we've created maybe in the past actually hurting our neighbors and hurting us now and how can we rethink them um, to have a better food system where everyone has access to free delicious organic uh, ingredients and i would just say um you know going back to the land just honoring our ancestors honoring you know the lenny lenape honoring the black and brown people that have that have been subsistence farmers doing this for centuries and centuries I mean, that's what it, that's the most important thing. Um, just recognizing the history of growing our own food and the importance it's played in so many cultures and it'll continue to play. I think, and you know, since the fifties and on, we've kind of become disassociated where, with where our food comes from, but you know, we're getting back into that, but you know, really again, recognizing kind of who's on this land before us and how they cultivated it, how they sustained this balance between the ecosystem and food production. Justin, thank you so much for uh, bringing everything together in a full circle. So I really hope, thank you again to everyone who joined today, the panelists, Rodale Institute for joining us, or for hosting, I should say, uh, William Penn Foundation for the work on the green, um, Grow Clean, Clean Water campaign um, and supporting that as well. Um, and thanks, as I mentioned, I'm Julie uh, Hancher of Green Philly. We're here to chat about sustainability, food, and all these other great things. So I think, um, you know, just wrapping this all up, right? How we got here with our local food system, thinking about how we can change things for the better with each of these uh, panelists and their, the incredible work they're doing. So please check them out, support them how you can. Um, and I saw that Rodale will be following up with some links and additional um, comments as well. So thank you all. To, uh, and I hope that you're more inspired about the local foods and communities around you. And I hope you have a lovely, Saturday and maybe the sun will come out. So have a great day. Thanks again.